rugby, it is one of the most popular team sports in the modern world today. It is a game that brings people together. Fans live and breathe the game. It is rarely watched or played without passion. Players have become idolised role models and celebrities. The game has evolved tremendously over time, as it initially started over a hundred years ago at rugby school, when William Webb Ellis picked up the ball and ran with it during a football match. This took place on the close, which is the same pitch that the rugby school first 15 still play on today. This documentary focuses on how the rugby ball has influenced the game and sport since that epic day. Gilbert and Webb Ellis are the two most prolific and renowned manufacturers of rugby balls since the game began. The original place in which the rugby balls were made is still in use, but now is the Webb Ellis Museum. The museum is full of memorabilia and shows the history, progression and the significances of the game throughout the years. John Batchelor was the head stitcher for first Gilbert and then Webb Ellis for almost half a century. He spoke of the changes he had witnessed over time and how he used to stitch the balls together. Yeah, my name is John Batchelor and I originally started as an apprentice at James Gilbert's about 1948 and overall I worked probably around about 46 years eventually finishing with Webb Ellis, the company. And uh, I retired some years back, obviously, but I've always had a great love for the game and seen a lot of changes over the years. Originally, the balls were made from cowhide, which was the original ball. Before that, obviously, all they had was a pig's bladder, but the company were boot and shoemakers to the school, so they wanted the bladder covered with leather, and that's how it began. Later on, a gentleman called Richard, Richard Linden developed a rubber bladder. Well, once they'd got that, they could then get some conformity to the shape. But obviously when leather got wet and heavy, it ex under pressure it expanded and became more rounded all the time. The advent of the modern ball, where now mostly they're made of cotton rubber laminates, means you can, and they're waterproof so you can guarantee the weight and the shape. That is the major difference. Also, you can put a grip on the surface of the ball. So, eventually it makes the game much quicker than it used to be in the olden days. There's less knocking on. Or you couldn't spin the ball about like you can today. Because in the wet it gets so slippery. The weight was a major factor. Particularly kicking, you know, uh, conversions and so forth. Well, you couldn't convert them in the manner that you can today. Well, money in the sport obviously leads to greater technology and you're always aiming for perfection. So, you know, balls are tried out in wind tunnels and all manner of things because how you arrange dimples on the surface of a ball is how it will act through the air, the same as a golf ball will. And so you're constantly trying to strive for perfection. And the thing is as well, you see with a new ball and you play a lot of game under floodlights and they're white and what have you, what different colours they are, well they show up. With the old leather ball, say it was a wet, wet evening or something like that, it'd be very dark in colour and it wouldn't show up as well. Mitre were the first people to go to like the plastic finish, okay. but that basically was a very uh, smooth, smooth thing, it was very brittle. In the winter it would crack all along the seams. So what Gilberts did, they developed a much smoother, a much softer 
surface that was more resilient and you know sort of moved about it didn't uh, it wasn't uh, so brittle as the as the mitre one and so that made it and then eventually oh you got a plastic surface with uh, dimples on it as well so that it gave a, a better grip so you constantly up that, update that to, you know to make it better and better but what it's done I suppose is make the game quicker because there are less passes dropped well <laughs> than there was in the old days if you like yeah because it is a quicker game because people know it's fully professional they're far, far fitter than they ever were. And so the game is quicker. Rugby Lions Rugby Club is key in developing and coaching the youth of today in hope to progress them from grassroots to professional rugby players. The original style rugby ball was used in a training exercise to compare the old style ball with the modern day ball. The players then spoke about the advantages and disadvantages that they experienced. The old ball feels lighter but it's just not as good, it's harder to throw and not as good to catch. Uh, it's just the shape of it, it's not as aerodynamic as the new, new ball, yeah the new ball is much better. I don't like it because it's a bit too small and it's like more like football. Um, it's lighter and it's got less grip on it. It's like as you throw it, it's harder to catch and it uh, goes through your hands a bit more. I think there'll be a lot more penalties in the game and the game will be like less flowing than it is, so like more knock-ons and stuff like that. It feels weird because I'm used to playing with a normal ball. Like you can play rugby with one hand. So it's a lot easier to carry. I don't know, I suppose because you get used to the ball, but. I, it didn't travel as far when I, th when I passed it, so it dipped a lot earlier. So you couldn't, you couldn't be as wide game, you couldn't play as expansive. But it's easier to like, if you're going to hand off, it's easier to pass around with one hand. So you can hand off and fend a lot more. But when you're actually passing it, it doesn't travel well. And it, it dips and drifts a lot in the wind. Because you can't pass it as far, there'll be more contact, more rooks and walls, and a lot more forwards game. I thought it was alright to pass like short distances because you can get your hand around it easily and because uh, it's quite small and light but I wouldn't like to pass it off quite far because uh, it doesn't really move in the air that well. It hasn't got the weight to it like a normal ball has. The old ball uh, is better for kicking because of the shape. Uh, you can, it's a lot easier to kick but this one like because it's rounder I don't think the bounce would be as difficult as the new one so it's a bit easier to predict where it's going to go. This one, if it was like wet, I think you wouldn't be able to play with it that well because there's not much grip on it. But for like short passing, I think it's probably better. The coach of the Colts team spoke of his experiences over the span of his rugby career, how the ball has influenced tactics, trainings, roles and play. If you use this in the modern game, I think it would encourage more of a running game with the ball rather than a passing game, which would then break the game down more forwards orientated you wouldn't see a very expansive game with a ball using this because if you try to kick it because it's not aerodynamic it wouldn't travel far and you wouldn't get a true bounce the ball would just hit the ground and just roll whereas with a rugby ball it hits the ground and then bounces and bounces and bounces so as years gone gone by the ball has developed from this to that I think it would encourage the players to carry the ball one-handed, so therefore it encourage more running with the ball rather than passing. It, it would be a completely different game to what, to what the modern game is now, using this. When I first started playing rugby in the late 70s, early 80s, we did play with predominantly leather balls. When the ball got wet, the leather ball, it, was, it became very heavy, but it also didn't it wasn't as aerodynamic and it would slip through your fingers, it would be like a bar of soap. So the development of the, what they call all-weather balls, which these are, then you can play them in wet or dry and the, 
the condition of the ball doesn't change. I think the development of the all-weather balls certainly was a, uh, a step in the right direction because it encouraged more open play, longer passing, and players could handle the ball better, so therefore the ball wasn't, the ball wasn't being dropped, so therefore the, the play would continue for longer rather than being dropped and stop and scrum and things like that. We interviewed the patent holder and manufacturer of the old original style rugby ball, Simon Hawksley. Richard Linden was the inventor of the original rugby ball. He was also the inventor of the galvanised rubber bladder and he was the inventor of the stirrup pump, which was a brass handled pump at the time, which they still make today in plastic. Um, he'd gone to the great exhibition in Crystal Palace in 1851, been impressed by rubber and felt that that would be a suitable substitute for the pig's bladder that he was using at that time. The biggest advantage that balls in general got from Mr Linden's invention was the fact that for the first time in history, or the history of the ball, you're able to standardise the shape of the ball. And as a myth, um, I'd always believed um, from a very early age that uh, Richard Linden, who was the inventor of the rugby ball, had actually gone bust, or at least died a pauper, because he didn't patent his designs for either the bladder, the pump or the ball themselves, whereas his counterpart, uh, William Gilbert, who was another cobbler that worked just down the street, had massive access to London and the rest of the world and did take patents out on his particular design of ball and to this day is hugely successful. Um, bizarrely, I got in touch with the patents office in Cardiff to say, you know, did anybody ever patent or take out registered design on the very first ball and the answer came back as no. So in 2005 I did just that and that's the reason I'm the owner of the original rugby ball. Since Richard Linden designed the original rugby ball which as you can see from this footage is, is quite small, um, the game has changed in its dynamics quite significantly. Uh, it's moved from um, a children's sport at school to an adult sport. Um, adults naturally have got larger hands, a lot more strength goes into it, and the ball design has accommodated that. Also, the, the ball that Richard Linden built was a hybrid. It was semi-spherical, so it was halfway between a football and what we recognise today as a more torpedo-shaped rugby ball. The rugby ball has evolved into a torpedo shape through aerodynamics more than anything. As the game has progressed and speeded up, the ability to throw the ball, kick the ball, etc., needed to be enhanced. So the design that you see today as a spherical ball was designed as much for its aerodynamics as anything else. Uh, one could argue that to do a conversion with a rugby ball is a feat in itself. Um, and therefore the ball, in one sense, handicaps. But as the game is predominantly designed to be a, a, a ball game played from hand to hand, the design that you see today is designed when it spins to flow through the air like a bullet would do. As the game progresses, um, rugby union as a game is global and it has a massive audience. And rugby union today, compared to two decades ago, is a game that is wholly defined by athletes, uh, people that can run 100 metres in under 14 seconds, even if they're 17 stone. Um, where the ball sits into that game is it does add to that dynamic and um, it makes for a safer game. Uh, there's less accident with the ball, it's not slipping around in your hands, it's not uncontrollable. And in order to keep up with the pace of the game, I think it's extremely significant that development does go into the, into the ball. And who knows, in, in another 10 years' time. So what does the future hold for the rugby ball? I think they could probably make the material they make it out of more um, robust. So the, the grip doesn't wear down as much. And even, even having some, like, raised grip portions on it. If 
anything's going to change with the rugby ball in the near future, it's more likely to be its colour. I can see a situation where, as a winter sport, um, they will start looking at things like high visibility colours and trying to sexy the ball up in, in those sort of dynamics. Well, I think you've taken it possibly as far as you can take it. You can only make it stickier, I suppose, or smoother, or whatever. But you, you see now, you've got players who, who have gloves on to try and combat everything, to hold the ball. Uh, so, so, I think you, you can go too far, and you probably then go over the top and you're tending to spoil it. Well, you've got to have some mistakes in the game, haven't you? Whatever happens in the future, there is no doubt of the influences that the ball has had on the game. This makes it one of the most unnoticed, but key elements in driving the sport from the initial schoolboy game into the global phenomenon that is rugby today.